everyone and welcome back to Atman Unlimited. Sorry about the little hiatus. Uh, we had a holiday in the States come up and then before the holiday I've been crazy busy. Uh, didn't mean to leave you hanging. So we're going to get back to the cam portion of the meat slicer knob that we did the CAD video on uh, last time. Now when we did the CAD video uh, what I tried to do was actually do the CAD work and the video at the same time. And after I watched the video and edited it, I didn't think it came out as, as good as it should have. And I was having a hard time concentrating on, you know, making sure I did the model correct, and then also making sure that, you know, I'm trying to make the video correct as well. So I don't think I'm going to do that this time with the cam. I already cammed the part, and then what I'm going to do is just kind of review my thought and my mindset and how I'm camming this part. So with that said, um, let's get back into Fusion 360 and go over the camming uh, for this meat slicer knob. Okay, we're back in Fusion 360 and we are in the camming environment. Uh, you can get there by selecting cam. Uh, so like I said, I've already got the part cammed and we're going to review and go over um, my mindset and you know the processes that I use to make this part. So the first we've got actually two parts we need to machine here. We've got the knob which is the new part we're going to make and then we've got this other piece that we're calling the mount uh, which we need to modify. Now the modification for this is real simple. Remember there's a flange on the bottom of this that we didn't model. We're just going to use a couple of toe clamps and just clamp it down and then the operation is just going to be a contour. So it's just a 2D contour on uh, this edge here. And I set the machining parameters very light, uh, very conservative. I don't want to mess this part up. And the machining operation is only about two minutes anyway. Um, so we're just taking very light step over, uh, very low fees and speeds. I think this part is a die cast zinc. I thought it was cast aluminum, but when I actually completely disassembled um, the, the remnants pieces that they gave me, there's quite a bit of weight to this piece, so I, I think it's die cast zinc. Uh, so we cut our feeds and speeds in half, um, just because zinc's a little bit harder material than aluminum, and we'll just contour it. So that's the operation to modify the mount. Real easy. So then for the knob, um, one thing that I do if I'm making a round part is I make a solid for the stock. So I just went in the modeling environment and I just created a cylinder that represents the stock and then referenced it to the knob part with a joint so that they stay together. So we're going to split this up into two operations. We're going to machine the, the front of it and then we'll machine the back of it. I'm going to machine the front of the knob first um, using a set of 60 degree V jaws to hold the round bar stock. We're going to make this out of a piece of bar stock. So my first operation, I set my uh, reference on the bottom of the part. So I'm going to set up my machine coordinate system to my Z offset will be referenced to the bottom of my V jaws. And then the zero, uh, I'll set just uh, reference to the center of the piece of bar stock. So I'll just use an indicator to sweep it in real quick. Our first operation that I always do is I always tend to face my stock off and that gives me an, a known reference, known distance. Uh, we're going to use a three inch uh, six insert uh, facing mill here. And we're just going to take one pass as a rough pass and then a second finish pass. Uh, we'll cut the feed in half just so that we get a nice surface finish here. This is going to be a pretty big surface, so we want to make sure that's uh, looking good for the customer. After we uh, face it, we're going to go into a roughing mode. Um, so we're going to use a three-quarter inch, three-flute uh, corn cob rougher, and we're going to go full depth of cut. And then what this is, is this is just a 2D adaptive tool path. Uh, so if I were to edit this, you'll see that the geometry I selected was just this lower profile and then I did a stock contour 
because if you don't do the stock contour with the uh, 2D tool paths, it will assume that you have a square stock. Uh, and then it, your, your tool path will think that it's square stock instead of round stock. So that's why we do the stock contours. Um, and then the other thing uh, that we have to remember is we modeled the chamfer on this part. So see this 50 thou chamfer we modeled in here? So this contour that we selected is not at the bottom of where we actually want to cut. We want to take the material off all the way down to here so that when we flip the part over and we go to uh, chamfer it, you know, we won't have this little hunk of something sticking out here that wasn't machined off. So in the depths uh, setting for this tool path, or the height setting, uh, we set the selected contour and then I took it down uh, a tenth of an inch. So that should clear this chamfer and then give me a little bit extra. Uh, so then since we have the roughing uh, three quarter inch rougher in, we'll do also we're going to rough out this little uh, center inset section. So we're going to do a helical interpolate. Uh, remember end mills don't like to be plunged. They're not drill bits. So we want to try to keep them moving uh, forward while we're plunging them. And we're going to use a reduced feed rate uh, for this operation just because we are plunging in Z while we're uh, rotating in X and Y. Then once we get to the bottom, we'll continue our helical out until we get close to the wall. So then that will rough our part for us. Then we'll do a tool change and we'll switch over to a three quarter inch finishing end mill. Now remember the corn cob is going to leave like a serrated pattern uh, in the wall of, of this part while it's roughed in. So the finishing end mill has to go off and take off that little bit of extra stock and then we'll do an extra pass uh, just to clean it up and again we want to leave a really nice surface finish here. Then there's another thing I'm going to do and this is uh, thinking ahead a little bit. When I finish the first operation here and I flip the part over I need to have a good way to get a good zero reference on it because we're going to do this back chamfer on operation two. And chamfering is one of the telltale signs of how well you are able to re-zero that part in uh, for operation two. Chamfers are a dead giveaway if you have a little bit of offset uh, in your zero. So what I'm going to do is after I finish machining the real part, I'm just going to machine this quick reference off the stock as low as I can go without hitting my V-jaws. So my V-jaws are three-eighths of an inch tall. This is going down a half inch. Uh, so that will leave me about an eighth of an inch clearance above the vise, more than enough. And it will leave me a nice round surface that's a machine surface here that when I flip the part over, I can then re-zero the center of the part in for operation two. So that's going to be critical when we go to do operation two. Then we're going to switch over and then we'll finish the inside here. So again, we're just going to ramp in nice and slow and go around. We're going to, again, we're going to take two passes, one to clean off the corn cob um, from the rougher and then one to give us our finish uh, surface. The next operation we're going to do is just this countersink here. We're going to do a helical interpolation again using a 3 8 inch end mill. This is just going to be a 3 8 inch uh, three flute end mill when we'll helical in and then we'll do a couple of passes around to clean up on the bottom. Uh, and then I did a final finish pass um, just to clean it up, make it look nice. Then we're going to switch over to a center drill and just do a quick uh, drill here. Now I also made a change here where I modeled this chamfer. Uh, and the reason why I modeled this cham chamfer is if you're using a center drill and you model the chamfer, you can select this face and then that will tell the drilling tool path here to drive the tool deep enough to where it will leave this nice chamfer for you and then you don't have to come back and do it again. So we can center drill to locate our hole and do the chamfer all in one operation. So that's why we model you know, these chamfers. Uh, then we switch over, we're going to use a number seven drill. And we're not going to peck drill, we're just going to do a 
straight drill in and a rapid out. Um, this is a very shallow drill depth, so no, no reason to peck or anything. Uh, then we're going to switch to our chamfer tool. We're just going to chamfer this edge, just do an edge break on it, 10 thou chamfer. And then we're going to switch over and chamfer the top. Now, the top, because this is a 50 thou chamfer, we're using a quarter inch uh, chamfer mill. Uh, we don't want to take all of that off in one whack. Uh, so we're going to do a couple of steps into it uh, so that we don't overload the chamfer mill. The flutes on a chamfer mill tend to be pretty small so you can get chip packing in the flutes pretty easily. So then that will conclude the first operation of the knob. So then we'll take it out of the vise and we'll flip it over and we'll machine the backside. Now here's the problem. Not only do we have to reference this part in XYZ, so we need, you know, we're going to reference this face will be the Z0 when I flip it over because it's going to be in the bottom of my vise now. And then the XY0 for uh, the next operation will be the center point again. So those are relatively simple to find. We can use the bottom of the vise for our Z0 and then we already machined a little bit of material off here that's a nice centered edge that's concentric that we'll be able to sweep an indicator on. We'll be able to get a very accurate uh, zero for XYZ. The problem here is that because of this shape and the contours that we have that we want to chamfer, so we're going to, when we flip this over, we're going to want to do this back chamfering. We need to reference this part rotationally as well. We have to clock it correctly. And if you think about it, that's actually pretty easy to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace one of my V jaws with a straight jaw. So the jaw in the back of my vise, I'll put a straight jaw in, and then that will be square or parallel with Y and square, or parallel with X, square with Y. And then because this point and this point is perpendicular to Y and parallel with X, it will clock the part for me. So then I don't have to worry about having to clock it in. The straight jaw will just bridge against these two items and you know clock the part for me. And then the V jaws will pick up and just clamp here. So I'll have three points of holding. Uh, not as secure as having two V jaws, but it should suffice for what we have to do. Uh, one of the things that we're going to have to watch out for is we don't want to reef the, the living heck out of this thing or because we're, we're kind of clamping on small radiuses here, you could, you could deform and damage the part. So we got to be a little careful when we put it in the vise. So that's going to be the setup uh, for the last operation. Now again, just like previously, I'm going to face the part off. I didn't do a finish pass because this is the bottom of the part and when it's installed uh, on the meat slicer you're not going to see this surface so we just did one pass we're just squaring it up and cleaning it up um, even running at 100 inches a minute with this tool it leaves a very good surface finish on the back then we'll switch back to our roughing end mill three quarter inch uh, corn cob and we'll take off this material here and we're going to come you know within 10 thou of this edge or this face the round face and then the, the lower face then we're going to do the same thing as on the other side and we're going to do a helical plunge and then we'll clear out the inside of this. Then we're going to switch to a finishing mill and just like on the other side we'll finish this, we'll do two passes again, one to get rid of the corn cob uh, uh, striations and then one to give us a nice surface finish. Same thing on the ID. Then we're going to switch back again to a 3 8 end mill and we'll do a helical interpolation and then a 2D adaptive clear on the ID of this part. So this inset piece here. Now one of the things that I see a lot of people neglect to do is they don't model their tool holders. Okay, If you notice I have every tool that you've seen me select I'm always modeling my tool holders. And the reason why is a lot of machine crashes are related to the tool stick out. 
if you don't have enough tool, it's very easy to overlook that, oh, my tool holder is going to collide into my part. So I always recommend that you model the tool holder. It's very easy to do. It's just in the tool setup. You, you, you define your tool holders ahead of time. And, you know, most tool holders are very similar in geometry. I mean, you know, a couple of collet holders, you know, some end mill holders, you know, maybe some shrink vit holders or some hydraulic holders, but they all have similar geometry. So it's pretty easy to do. And by doing this step, when you run your simulation, you can see if your tool holder is going to collide with the part. So by running the simulation, we know that this stick out is going to be one inch. We're going to have one inch end mill sticking out here. And that's more than enough. Uh, to reach all the way down into this pocket and correctly machine it. So then after we do the uh, 2D adaptive clearing, we're going to just do a simple uh, contour to finish up and give us a nice surface finish. Then we're going to switch over to our chamfer mill. We're going to reach all the way down to the bottom here and just put that little edge break right there so we got a nice edge down there. And again, tool holders modeled. Now if you notice this tool holder, that's an ER32 collet holder. This tool holder is an ER16 tool holder. And again, I know how much stick out I have on my tools and I use my setup sheets to know that when I install the tools in the tool holders. So that's why I use the setup sheets. Again, it's all trying to mitigate and making sure that you're going to make this part and not crash anything. So then after that, we're just going to finish up our chamfering. We're going to just do an edge break chamfer here, edge break chamfer here, edge break chamfer here. And then at the bottom, we got to scroll down. We've got one more chamfer here. And again, this is the same tool path that we used in the, the first operation, where we're just going to walk in and take three passes at it and kind of chip away at this because it's a very large chamfer. So that's the camming for this part. Not too difficult. Uh, just break it down operation by operation and uh, you, can, you can work through it. So in the next video we're going to post this code out to the machine and then we'll actually uh, run the part and see what we get out of the machine. So thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you when we make the part.